Okay, well, we are going to be in Psalm 50 today, verses 7 through 15. So if you brought your Bibles with you, and I hope you did, uh, feel free to turn there. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard. So uh, if you have a different translation, you can either follow along in your Bible or read on the screen uh, behind me. We're going to do something different today and go ahead and start in prayer. So will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the truth of Christ. We thank you for your word that is truth and light and life and that that word became flesh in the person of Jesus and took our penalty that we deserved on himself so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be restored to right relationship with you and we could take Christ's righteousness righteousness on ourselves. God, we pray that in this new year, we would be drawn to you in more and more powerful ways, in the deep things of God, that we would yearn for you more than our daily bread, and that we would follow Christ in every facet of life. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, we're kicking off the new year with a brand new series, brand new year. We're focusing on how we spend our life. Everything from our possessions and our money down to our time and ultimately what we'll do with our retirement one day. We're, we're looking at uh, where our focus is going to be as far as our energies and our attention. And that brings me to a little lesser known fairy tale that I would like to tell you. Once upon a time, there was a man who had two dogs, a female dog and a male dog. Well, he fed the female dog, but he did not feed the male dog. So over several months, the female dog grew healthy and strong, helpful and loving whereas the male dog grew uh, wiry. And as he had to hunt for his own food, he became angry and bitter and not at all to be trusted. Well, so after several months of this, the man finally realized, you know, we had thought this before, but now we have the scientific evidence to back this thought up. It seems that female dogs are, in general, more healthy and better behaved than male dogs. And so he shared these facts with the townspeople, and lo, there was much rejoicing over this new detail. The end. Okay, so maybe it's not so much of a fairy tale, maybe more like an Aesop's fable for today. And I'm sure that you heard what I heard in this as well. We know that what we feed will grow. And so we're talking about that specifically with relation to a very biblical principle called stewardship. Well, let's actually look at that definition. That's one of those 20-point Scrabble words. What does that mean? Well, the dictionary defines stewardship as the office, duties, and obligations of a steward the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So we're going to be talking about stewardship this whole month of January. And we're going to be using three word pictures to do it. One is that of a dartboard, the bullseye. So we're going to use that idea, the bullseye, but also a high-definition TV as a set in distinction to, you may remember the old vacuum tubes, curved screens, not very clear, high def, that picture of high def. And then lastly, that sweet spot. And if you're into sports, then you understand what that means. That sweet spot of, oh, you're just clicking right where you need to be with your sport. So we're going to be using these ideas, these word pictures, to talk about stewardship and where the focus of our uh, lives 
and where our energies and attitudes are in 2015. So we're going to be spending time feeding matters of eternal significance so that they will grow. Now I'm going to go ahead and give up what we're going to be dealing with each Sunday in January. The first week today is we're going to be talking about mine. What do you do with what you call mine? But there's also a double meaning there in terms of mining precious jewels or precious metals from the earth's core. Sometimes you got to dig. And then next week we'll be talking about wealth. What do you do with your money? For you, is it all about the Benjamins or do you use the Benjamins to provide for what your life is really all about. The third week, we're going to talk about our stewardship in time. How do you spend your time? And what does that say about what or who you value? And then the last week in January, we're going to talk about for retirement. Now, this may be confusing to you, what with my big burly man beard here, but I'm a ways from retirement. So I don't, I don't even think the word's even in the Bible, is it? Well, so at any rate, we're going to pass that off to Doug and let him talk to us about <laughs> what retirement is. Even though he's not retired, God bless his soul. So... We're going to talk about all of these things. And what you may have noticed or you may not have noticed is all of these weeks set us up with a sentence. Mine, wealth, in time for retirement. The focus that we're taking in this first series of 2015, I almost said 13, of 2015 is to look into God's word, examine Christ, examine the word and mine, dig for that wealth that we find ultimately in Christ. In time, not just for our earthly retirement and what we do there, but our eventual earthly retirement from this life where we step into eternity. And are we going to be ready for that? Have we been mining the wealth and the truth of God's word in preparation for that day. So, this week, talking about that sweet spot of what's mine. Well, like I said, there's a double meaning there. And so we're starting with our first point, and that is my life is mine. Maybe that's not your perspective, but sometimes we can have that perspective. Regardless of what our perspective is about our life, the way we look at our lives are going to affect us. It's going to affect what we do. It's going to affect who we, who we spend time with. It's going to, expe- uh, it's going to affect uh, the activities of our days. We see this from toddlerhood on. I hear this constantly around my house. No, that's mine. No, you can't have it. It's mine. Now, as we grow older, we get better about being more respectful with that attitude, but sometimes that still lingers. I was thinking about this earlier this week. Oh my gosh, I've passed this on to my kids from the very earliest days when they start crawling and they start grabbing at things and you're like, oh no, that's, that's breakable. And so we start pulling it away and I'm wondering, were my kids making these, like, these mental furrows in their brains? Oh, that's not mine. That's somebody else's. And so it just comes to be natural later on when they're given something that they didn't earn, they didn't pay for, but it's mine. It's mine, and we create little golems. My precious, right? It's mine, right? So what are some of those things that we label as mine? This is the place where you get to share. I just want you to call out some different things and participate in this. What are some things that we usually label as mine? Time. Time. It's my time. Life. Life. My life. Yeah. Money. Money. 
Money? Okay, let's get more than two people <laughs> offering. But yeah, yeah, money. This is, this is my money. What else? My car? What I hear over here? Is ch- my chair? Yeah, the, the, this is my chair. This is my desk. This is my food. Yeah. What, huh? My phone? What are you doing with the phone? You're too young for Yeah, exactly, right? My phone. What else? Toys. My toys. Yeah, bringing it up. My toys, my phone, my money, my time, my life. Our perspective can change things. Well, what's interesting is as we get older, sometimes that attitude beca- can become so ingrained in us that we're, we literally think we got all that we have on our own. Oh, but we had help. Even if we're talking about uh, our, um, our kids or our spouses, we had to have help in these things. Somebody else had to have the spouse that we then married. We had to have the kids. That, uh, so all of life we had help with. And that's what God is reminding us through the presence of the Holy Spirit in David's words in Psalm 50. Starting in verse 7, if you want to follow along with me of Psalm 50, God is speaking and he says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine, and all it contains Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. Now this is interesting because even back in David's day, the Holy Spirit is reminding the people of Israel just as he's reminding us today that the sacrificial system was not so that the people could give to God something that God needed. Like, I'm hungry. Where are my sacrifices? So he's reminding them that's not the point of the sacrifices. I'm, I'm showing you how to be thankful, to live a life of thankfulness. But mine attitudes have a way of leading us away from this behavior of thankfulness. It can lead us actually to loneliness. If we have this walled off perspective of everything I have is mine, I got here on my own merit, my own grit and determination, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, I didn't have any help, then we could run the risk of winding up very lonely. And when we have attitudes like that, we certainly aren't going to go to God in times of trouble. With a mine attitude, we have a way of thinking, I earned this, I deserve this. Well, that's difficult because when things get hard, then then we want to look at God. Why is this happening to me? I've done everything I know how to do. And yet now I'm suffering in this way. Why is that? Why is this happening? I've done everything I should have done. Problem with the mind attitude is it has us going to God almost as a last resort. But is that what we should be doing? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew Chapter 6, verse 33. This is after Jesus has been telling the crowds about all of the things that you need. There are things that you need like shelter, food. You need work to do. There's all kinds of things that you need. And listen to what Jesus says. But seek first his, God's, kingdom 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God is not surprised by our needs, and he does provide for our needs. Why? How does he do that? Well, the psalmist tells us, David tells us, it's because the world is God's. It all belongs to him. And so our attitude for as much or as little as we have should be one of thankfulness to God for all of his many blessings, whatever that may look like in our lives. And so that leads us to our second point. My life is God's. Your life is God's. But I and you are called to mine it, mine it with the wealth. This, this is what Jesus is hitting on when he talks about the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearl of great price. He likens these things to the kingdom of God. And he, he tells us that there is nothing in this world that is more worthwhile, that is more deserving of our affection of our time, of our efforts, than the kingdom of God, to possess the kingdom of God. And while that could bring up questions, though, couldn't it? Why doesn't God just give us what we need? And as I was thinking about that this past week, especially as I was going through our daily readings uh, in my utmost for his highest, it struck me that there are many, many things that I've grown accustomed to in my life that as much as I love them and as much as I need them now, they're not really needs. Do I need a cell phone? What if I got rid of one? How did all of you older people live, survive without cell phones? But now it seems like a need. Is it really? What in our life is really just a want instead of a need? My life is God's. Why doesn't he just give us all these things that we want? Well, I think some of it has to do with the fact that he knows our hearts. He knows our hearts, and he knows how very often our wants can become needs to the point that we are controlled by these wants and needs. Now, if you've seen, now the audio is gone. Where's the, oh, there we go. Now, oftentimes, when we're thinking about our needs, what we're looking at is really our wants. And our wants can come after us. They can be chasing us down until we feel like we're controlled by all of these wants and all these things that we call mine until they finally wind up controlling us and we wind up getting stuck. But even when we are stuck in that, we still want more, don't we? We still want to call out, oh, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. He knows our wants. He knows our needs. He doesn't always give us our needs, or sorry, our wants, but he will always provide for our needs. I've asked Rick to come forward and share some of his testimony about this area, so go ahead and come on up. One thing I learned growing up is uh, I had a grandmother that loved the Lord, and she believed that everything she owned was her was God's. My grandfather passed away at a very young age and left my grandmother a widow. <clears throat> my grandmother had no driver's license, no car. <clears throat> she had no health insurance. But <clears throat> every Sunday, her table was full of people that had a need from the church that she went to, to food. Her home was always open to um, those that were in need, needed a place to stay. And so I saw this example through my life 
that everything that belonged to her actually belonged to God, and she used it to bring honor and glory to him. And throughout my life, that has been my desire. There's been a couple times in my life that God reminded me that everything you have, Rick, belongs to me. <clears throat> One time as I, I had a good job and working up the ladder really quickly, um, thought I was going to be successful, and I got injured, <clears throat> and that ended that career real quick. <clears throat> And it was at that time that God allowed me to start my own business, of which I've been in almost 32 years now. And God has met every need and taken care of me all the way through. And it's interesting of talking about that everything we have belongs to God. I had a privilege for several years of working with Native Americans. I sat down with an older Native American one day, and I said, why do you think it was so easy for the white man to take your land? He says, because we believe that land didn't belong to us. It belonged to God. And everything that we had, God entrusted us to take care of. And I thought that was amazing that a whole culture of people that once walked North America that we knew had the idea that their land, everything belonged to God. And they were only to take care of it the best. And then you look at where are we today? Just as David said, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And so I think because we have an attitude sometimes, we lose out on the blessing that God has for us to share what he's given us, to bring honor and glory to him and blessing. And there's another thing my grandmother often said too, so we need to remember, Greg, we're a citizen of heaven. We're just passing through this world. We don't belong here. And God promises to take care of us. So my life is God's. This is what scripture teaches us. My life is God's. It all belongs to God. And yet there's also a very real reality that in a sense, it is your life and your choices. It is my life and my choices. And so Jesus asks us where your heart is with these choices. Going back to Matthew chapter 6, but looking, starting at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, that our hearts would be so focused on God that we would be holding so loosely to the things of this world that when we see a brother or sister in need, we would be so overwhelmed with love and compassion to them that we would just meet that need. Why? Well, because we can. Why wouldn't we meet that need? Why wouldn't we do that? As we were singing this morning, for I am his and he is mine. That's the other side of the things that we own. Yes, these things are ours, but whose are we? We belong to God. Look at what 1 Peter 4 verses 8 through 11 say. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. We are recipients of God's grace in all that we have. It is a gift that we have received. And so it is a gift to be given. It is not something that is mine, not primarily. 
but we are stewards of God's grace. We are given the task of managing what he has given us so that his glory is made great, so that his name is exalted in the world and in our communities. And ultimately, no greater gift, no greater grace has come to men and women than Christ. And so all of Scripture points us to this Christ, this Messiah, anointed one of God. And it calls us to come to Christ. He is the one that rescues. He rescues us from sin and death. And it is for that reason that we gather here on Sunday mornings to worship him, to honor him. As David put it in Psalm 50, we honor God. And so, in conclusion, as we think about our lives, our attitudes, our affections, is God our source or is he just an add-on like what we might get at Cold Stone? We go there, and this life that we lead, oh, it's, it's ice cream. It's great. But every now and again, we'll add a topping. We'll, we'll mix a little God into our lives here and there, just enough to not feel guilty, but not so much that he transforms us. Is God our source? Scripture says he is. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, he is the one creator that holds all things together, sustains life. In him, we move and have our being in this life. And so, as the worship team comes forward, we're going to stand and sing a song of invitation. This is a time for, for you to think about what the word says and what it said to you this morning. It may be that you don't have uh, a relationship with Jesus where, where you can call him Lord and Master. You're not a disciple of Jesus following after him. Maybe this morning is the time for you to commit to that. Maybe you are looking for a church home. You're, you're going around and you're looking, you're like, ah, you know, I want to find just that right church, that, that church that, man, they, they sing the songs I like, they, they have a, a great preacher, uh, they got, um, you know, some great people. Well, I'm sorry that you didn't find any of those things here this morning, but, you know, there's no perfect church. And if you do find one, please don't join You'll mess it up, as we all would. We are all fallible human beings. As I've said numerous times, we are an imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. And so as we stumble and fumble in this life of faith, we grow together. And so maybe that's where you are. You want to join a body of believers that's not so perfect that they, you know, make you look bad, but yet you can tell there's a movement of God going on in that place. That's what we're striving for here, to live according to the Spirit of God. Or maybe you just need some prayer. I encourage you to come forward during this time or pray in your seats wherever you're standing. This is your time, your invitation from God, not from me, to be transformed in your heart by the Christ who loved you so much that he would die for you and give you his righteousness. There's nothing more worthy of our praise in song, so let's do it.